what's happening in some communities, they're not spending any money on affordable housing, for example. That's the, the biggest gripe. This, um, some communities maybe aren't spending enough on preservation or whatever it is. So I think setting up a plan that gets us spending money across all disciplines from the beginning and doesn't assume um, that 80% will go to affordable housing and parks and preservation will get 10. Maybe this year, the, the, the fact that the pendulum can swing year to year depending on the need um, I think is critical, and that all comes down to, as Lynn mentioned, the creation of that plan mm -hmm. and showing that the needs are across the disciplines and across the city. So my name is Erica Lindemood. I am the Education Director here at Old South Meeting House. Uh, this is the final program in a series that we've done this spring titled Churches, Cafes, and Community Centers, Historic Preservation for Boston's Neighborhoods. So I am very pleased now to turn things over to Greg Gaylor and our panel. And um. uh, so yes, I'm Greg Gaylor. I'm the executive director <coughs> of the Boston Preservation Alliance. It's great to see a lot of familiar faces, but a lot of new faces as well. And thank you for braving the lovely, what I like to call a grade A, gray <laughs> day. Um, <laughs> say that 10 times fast. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to have the panels quickly introduce yourselves. So I'm going to be moderating and trying to moderate anyway uh, tonight and try to keep us on time so we're not here all night long. Um, so why don't you guys introduce yourselves and then we'll jump right in. Okay. <coughs> I'm Carl Spector. I'm Commissioner <coughs> of the Environment for the City of Boston. I'm Kathy Cotteridis. I'm Executive Director of Historic Boston Incorporated. And I'm Jeff Gagno. I'm an Independent Historic Preservation Consultant and I'm here with my Preservation Massachusetts Eastern Massachusetts Circuit Rider hat on tonight. So. Great. Thank you all. And we've got a lot of experience here in the room with CPA, with the city and, and the diversity of things. So hopefully we'll have a good conversation. The goal tonight is really to have a dialogue, not so much for us to be talking at you, but to share some ideas on specific aspects of CPA. Uh, and the goal is really to get to sort of the third part of the discussion where we can get some ideas from you. Um, but the first thing I wanted to do is just try to get a sense of what people in the audience, what you all know and what you don't. So we're going to do a couple of show of hands just to get a sense. So. Raise your hand if you know many of the basics about CPA, what it is, how it's funded, and what kind of things the money can be used for. Just hold up your hand. All right, it's seems calm. like most people. <laughs> All right, how many people are excited about CPA coming to Boston? <laughs> Hopefully that's everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, how many people have specific projects or a specific project in mind that you think could benefit from CPA and you can't wait to tell us about it to write it down? <laughs> All right, so a good chunk of the people. Great. Uh, so I think everyone's very excited about CPA. It passed in the fall with 74% large coalition that I think Kathy will talk a little bit about in a minute, get it to pass. But I think everyone's anxious, and uh, the city's going to start collecting funds soon, but there's more to do in terms of figuring it out, and you'll hear about that in a minute. Um, it's not so simple to say we passed it, now the money comes flowing, and we start getting it out. So this is hopefully the first of many discussions. We know our peers in the parks community had a similar sort of brainstorming session um, a month or two ago um, to try to engage people and we need to figure out how this works. Because one of the great things about CPA is it's structured by the state as enabling legislation to allow a lot of flexibility. Every community is doing it a little bit differently. There are rules you have to follow, the things you can and can't do, but exactly how that shakes out is really up to you and everyone in the city and the mayor and city council and all of us working together to make that happen. So tonight, uh, we've divided into three sections. We're going to spend about 15 minutes on the first two, and then the remainder of the time on the last one, which is hopefully going to be the most exciting part. Uh, so part one is a brief discussion of, of what is CPA and an update on the CPA process, because I think there are probably a lot of questions in the room. We're not going to be able to answer all of them, and that's not really the goal of the discussion, is to talk about sort of the structure and the mechanics, but I figured a brief discussion to get that out of the way, answer some of the basics, and set it aside. Uh, section two is a discussion about the process for projects. Like I said, it can happen in different ways in different communities. So we wanted to toss around a couple of concepts and hear your thoughts about that. And after each of these sections, we'll have a few minutes for Q&A, uh, about 10 minutes. And then the third se section is really an idea to do some brainstorming about project ideas. So let's toss some ideas, that either some things you came in the room with or after the first two parts have come to mind. Specific projects, uh, context, uh, conceptions for projects that maybe um, relate to a number of different sites. Um, so that's the goal. So that's part three. 
Um, so any questions on that? All right, so let's just jump right in with part one. Um, what is CPA and sort of an update on the CPA process? Um, Carl, do you want to talk first? Well, are you going to talk Kathy. about the coalition that came together? Why don't you let Kathy, okay. and yep, Kathy talk and about that group, and I can just respond. bring quick things, Great. things quickly up to date after that. Nudge me if I go into what you plan on, on saying. <laughs> Um, can I first ask uh, if you would raise your hands if you are a Boston resident, a resident of the municipality? Um, and if you aren't, if you live in a community that is a CPA community already? Great. And that's terrific um, because it, it really, we're sort of at a point at which the CPA is being enacted through some of the um, structure that needs to be put into place. And uh, there's still room for some advocacy and for some, quite apart from projects, for uh, making sure that some of the decision-making systems are put into place in a way that are, um, are beneficial to the communities and neighborhoods of the city. And I'll get to that in a second. But as you know, CPA, Community Preservation Act, uh, recognizes the value and the um, importance of housing and accessibility to housing, historic preservation, and open space and recreation to the Commonwealth cities and towns. It also uh, recognizes the autonomy of municipalities to, under, to utilize um, the legislation passed in the early 2000s. I'm not quite sure I remember the 2001. year. 2001. Um, that gives municipalities the opportunity to assess between 1 and 3 percent surcharge on real estate taxes, uh, or real estate property, rather, um, within municipalities. And uh, communities have a choice, or municipalities have a choice of what percentage they wish to adopt. And in 2001, Boston tried, um, as you may recall, to pass CPA um, and, and was not successful at 3%. But after nearly 15 years and probably another uh, about 160 municipalities throughout the Commonwealth having undertaken it, um, and with great success and, and ability to undertake preservation projects, acquire land for recreation, to build affordable housing, it was really, um, Boston felt like it was being left out. And, and a coalition of housing, open space, and preservation advocates and um, interest groups came together and began conversations that ultimately led to the establishment of Yes for a Better Boston, which became a ballot, uh, led to a ballot question that I hope all of you were partially responsible for advancing last November, question number five, um, that approved a 1% surcharge on real estate uh, prop uh, values in uh, assessments in the city um, that ultimately is going to um, benefit the, the, the three broad areas of, um, of CPA in Boston. Uh, successful to the tune of 73%, is that correct? 74%, which means it was wildly popular. That was probably one of the most um, uh, um, successful measures on the, the ballot um, in, in Boston, at least. Um, and what that is going to do, in, in short, is generate um, up about $20 million in revenue that goes directly into CPA-distributed projects. 10% um, must go to each of the three broad areas of housing, open space, and preservation, and the balance is left to the discretion of the um, municipality and its priorities. That um, is, uh, that's the guiding framework, and the legislation also requires that there be a community preservation committee established within City Hall that is responsible for assessing and understanding the priorities in those three areas and making sure that um, and also reviewing proposals that come through after policies and procedures are put into place for accepting applications and, and all of the logistics of um, executing on um, CPA's uh, framework. Um, we're at a point now where that CPA committee is coming together, or at least the, the, um, the ordinance that is structuring that is coming together um, with the um, uh, various um, parts of government, uh, city council, mayor's office, and community advocacy putting forward their visions for how this um, uh, community, uh, committee, community preservation committee should come together. But it will um, fundamentally require, again, if I'm saying your stuff, let me know. Um, you can have it all. <laughs> five um, uh, mandatory seats that reflect um, 
five uh, specific disciplines within municipal government. So the head of, of the community development housing department uh, department, the head of environment or the conservation commission, uh, the head of recreation and parks. Um, it, those five are mandated within the legislation put forward by the state. Um, there are four others that are being um, uh, entertained as part of a nine member committee. Those are up for debate at the moment between the mayor, the council and, and the community. And yet when I mention community, I want to go back to the coalition that came together to advance this effort, the Yes for a Better Boston um, coalition, because it is probably uh, what we all, I mean, I hope I'm not speaking outside what w I assume to be the true, that we all felt, those of us involved in, in advancing this and advocating and planning this uh, ballot measure, really felt strongly that the best thing that came out of it was the, um, the broad-based coalition that worked collaboratively together and understood each other and respected each other's opinions so that there was never any debate about um, the, the balance of where money should go at this juncture, that we, d we agreed on processes, we agreed on balanced voices, we agreed on diversity representing the entire city, both in terms of um, composition ethnically, eth um, racially, um, economically, but also neighborhood balance and, uh, and also respect for each other's policy priorities. So that group is now staying together and uh, continuing, continuing to both advise and advocate both the mayor and the city council as they take on their responsibilities as mandated through the legislature to put the Community Preservation Committee together to establish priorities and to um, hire staff, which is actively happening at this point to support administratively these matters. Is that enough yeah, logistics? No, let's, All right. Let's stop there for now. <laughs> Carl? Well, <coughs> let, me, let me just add a, a little bit to what Kathy said since she gave such a good overview of the process. Um, as, as she said, there are ongoing discussions uh, between the, the mayor and the city council and all the groups that have been involved in determining how the last four seats of the of the uh, uh, Community Preservation Committee will be chosen. Um, I, I am confident that, w that we, will, we, we will come to an agreement on, on how that's uh, done soon. I mean, there's, uh, as Kathy said, enormous enthusiasm for this measure. Uh, it, was, it was a great day. Uh, I, I forget when it, when it was last summer when Mayor Walsh and, and many of the people here today got together and kicked off the campaign on City Hall Plaza. And uh, it's, it's, it's very exciting. Uh, there was a hearing, again, uh, at, the beginning of la at the beginning of last week, of which uh, some people here uh, participated, to continue the discussions and the debate on the makeup of that committee. And, and they're ongoing. The, uh, there was some question on a, in a technical way of whether the city could start collecting money uh, if the committee had not been in place and whether this uh, final ordinance was uh, not in place. And we have determined that uh, we, we will start collecting the fund that the Community Preservation Act uh, allows us to collect and they will just accumulate until the committee gets uh, in place, which we have to hope will happen as soon as possible and get to their very substantial work. Great, thank you, Carl. Um, so just a couple of comments of some things that didn't get mentioned. So. Just a reminder uh, for people who haven't looked at CPA in detail, so it's for capital projects only, so it's not for maintenance. Um, so it has to be capital construction of some sort. Um, and the other thing as far as this committee, like I said earlier, that th the way this functions in every city and town is a little bit different. So the, the first job of the committee is really to put together a plan, a CPA plan, so that will include some assessments and some analysis for all three needs. Uh, try to set some priorities, and then to figure out how projects do get approved. Different communities do it in different ways. The way it's commonly done is a uh, proposal comes to the committee, uh, they discuss it, they maybe offer some feedback, and um, it goes back for more review, um, eventually gets voted on by the committee and recommended to the mayor, and then it goes to city council. Um, one thing that the Yes for Better Boston group has been saying from all along, and in our discussions with city officials as well, is we want to make sure that this is a process that reaches the whole city and that small germs of projects that come up in neighborhoods have as good a shot of getting funded as the nice, polished, shiny proposals of 
um, a, an already established um, affordable housing group or historic site. Um, so that's, it's great that the city's already looking to hire staff because it's, on one level it's great in Boston, we've got a lot more money, but there's a lot more demand as well. So this is a bit of a new animal we're gonna have to figure out. So there are a lot of questions unanswerable yet at this stage because um, as people have, as we've said in the coalition, it's a bit trying to build a bike while you're riding the bike. <laughs> Um, but nonetheless, um, let's turn it over for questions related to at least that aspect, some of the structure questions that you might have um, for a few minutes, and then we'll go on to the next section. Yes. Hi, two quick questions. Are the uh, people on the committee, are they paid, number one? And my second question is whether the state is contributing any uh, money to the fund. All right, Carl, would you like to take that one? Um, I believe I believe that the members of the committee are not paid. That's correct. Yes, and the state does contribute. There is a, a matching fund at the state, and uh, and 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 I, I don't know. Maybe someone here knows the percentage of how it's matched, but we will be getting state funds as a partial match to what the city raises directly. Yeah, yeah go right ahead. All right. So there is a state match. Uh, the challenge with the state match is as more and more communities adopt CPA, Kathy mentioned when before the election it was about 161 or 163, now it's over 170 with Boston being one of them, is the pot of money just to get, has to get divided up that much more. Uh, and that's been a challenge over recent years, so there's actually a bill that's been introduced at the State House to enhance the funding structure, and the goal is to make the match a minimum of 15% every year. Now the communities that adopted CPA when it first came in back in 2001, 2002 were getting a 100% match, which was an amazing thing. Um, but now the fact that there are so many communities in, that means there are a lot of people voting up at the State House who want to support CPA. So that's ongoing. So there will be a state match. That's one of the great things. So we figured it would generate uh, 13 to $15 million locally and then be matched uh, by the state. Um, so, and no, they're not, it's a volunteer position. It will be a volunteer position in terms of on the committee. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you. I'd be interested in knowing how long committee members are expected to serve for and whether they're reappointed. Um, and then another thing, which uh, another question, which the devil is always in the details. And while I think God is a woman, I think the devil is certainly a male. Um, <laughs> we've had the unfortunate controversial issue of the Winthrop Square project in which funds were allocated unilaterally, eff effectively by the mayor for various worthy projects. Um, and I wonder to what extent it's clear that this committee will not be swayed by purely short-term political considerations in the way in which they choose uh, the project. Thank you. All right, so we've got how long people on the committee serve and how do we reduce sort of the political pressure on how things are funded or when the, selected? The terms that are being discussed right now, and I don't know whether this is within the state legislation or if it's, it's being not, debated, it's, lo it's, local it's locally determined, um, is general, it seems to be, there seems to be agreement around three-year terms, but no more than two consecutive terms for any individual serving, except those that are mandated by the legislation, legislation within city government. In the, in the, uh, there seems to be agreement on that within the ordinance as well. The initial terms will start off staggered so you don't have anyone rotate at the same time. In, in regard to your second question, I, I think that I would point to uh, you know, a lot of commissions that operate out of City Hall. You know, we, have the, uh, we, have, we have 10 uh, commissions uh, related to the Landmarks Commission uh, working mm -hmm. on historic preservation out of the Environment Department and the many other commissions, and if you go to those meetings, uh, you will hear a lot of independent thought. Now, uh, obviously, the, 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 uh, the mayor and city hall will have an opportunity to present their thoughts to the committee, too, but it will be a public process, and you know, it, it should, it'll be out in the open, and everyone will have an opportunity to uh, you know, comment on what's going on. So I think that's the most assurance that the, uh, the community can have. I would only amend that in that, um, and I'll, I'll speak for, as a member of the, the Yes for a Better Boston Committee, um, that uh, it is YBB's uh, feeling that by continuing to have a role 
in break, making recommendations through the ordinance establishing Boston's own um, framework for this, but continuing to have a role and, and continuing to represent both grassroots and broad-based um, engagement in, um, in CPA, that it will generate the, the, the best sense of what is going on across the city and be able to play a role in balancing out the, the what you're referring to, which is the occasional political um, influences that might uh, often come into discussions. And I guess two other quick points on that, and just to be specific since we're sort of talking around it. So Yes for Better Boston has asked initially for the all four seats. I think at this point we've probably rolled back to three of the seats, one being consider uh, someone that would be come from the business community potentially, um, that Yes for Better Boston would nominate three people for every one open seat, and then it would be up to either city council or the mayor that's part of the discussion at the moment to select. But the idea is since Yes for Better Boston represents 30 to 40 organizations of diverse types all across the city, that if that group can come to agreement on three people for every one, that gives a, a good bo boost of support that's not political um, in the same sense, but yet the oversight is by city council and the mayor. They make the final choice. They also make the final, they have to approve all the expenditure. And then the final thing I want to say, and I think we, we do have agreement for this, um, YVB was pushing for the staff of the CPA to be someplace in City Hall that's less likely to be pressured by City Council or the Mayor or any one of the three legs of CPA. Um, and the job posting that's come out for the staff is in the it's in Finance Administration, is that right, Carl? That's right. Um, which seems to be about as independent as you can get. It's not someone in the Mayor's office, it's not someone in Department of Neighborhood Development, which we've sort of talked about because that in some ways would fit. Uh, so I think we've made good progress and I think there's general agreement so far that things that are being debate, debated aren't so much about trying to keep this neutral and as apolitical as possible. So I think we're optimistic that it, this is all moving in the right direction. But it's a concern because it's a question that a lot of voters had, that this isn't just a, another slush fund for whoever, um, but that it really is community based. And that's part of this dialogue and this will be an <coughs> ongoing discussion. Right. Any other questions on part one, sort of the structural piece? All right, great, we'll move on to more interesting things. Um, <laughs> so keep your ears peeled. Uh, if you have an opinion on, you know, Yes for Better Boston's role, you can certainly let City Council know that. Uh, that's an ongoing debate. Feel free to pick up your phone and let them know that. Um, all right, on to part two, uh, which is a discussion about process for projects. Um, we had another panelist who was gonna join us for this piece uh, who was ill, unfortunately. So Jeff, do you wanna start off with this? Sure. I'll bounce some ideas off myself before. Yeah, I that's right. Well, I can, I can stand in for her. <laughs> well, I think, you know, for someone like me who's worked most of my career, in, worked mostly in the city of Boston, this is, feels like totally new territory because we've, <laughs> you know, after um, CPA didn't pass the first time around, it sort of fell off the radar screen until uh, the recent effort to revive it. So, um, you know, many of us working within the city limits of Boston didn't even take any of this funding or this process into consideration when we were looking at our projects. And, um, I think the important thing to realize is that um, there's now, you know, a, a whole database of successful projects and a track record for over 160 communities throughout the Commonwealth who've made this work and made it work effectively. So, um, while on the one hand it seems like we might be making this up as we go along, there's just, there's so many other models that I think um, can be followed um, that have been successful and have also demonstrated some of the pitfalls and some of the issues. Um, so don't forget about those places as we're moving forward and you know places like Cambridge that's had it forever practically um, is very sophisticated. Uh, I know others more recently coming on board Somerville of the city type and with city governments that are um, have this functioning uh, in it not the sort of town uh, town scale government so um, we should take comfort in the fact that this is proving to be effective and the processes uh, are fair and in place throughout the Commonwealth now. Um, so Greg gave me a few types of um, points that I might talk about um, based on what I've seen in my circuit rider work for Preservation Massachusetts. And that involves, um, I'm sort of a consultant on call for communities uh, east of Worcester uh, who uh, have preservation projects or issues that, that are um, brewing in their, their locality. And they can call me or email me and uh, I 
provide the best advice I can with the institutional backing of uh, Preservation Massachusetts and the resources that they've assembled. And so that was my crash course in CPA two years ago when I started this, um, was um, realizing that about 80% of the calls I was getting were about CPA-related projects. And so I had to get up to speed pretty quickly. And it's been really interesting to get a sense of how other communities um, are working with this program throughout the Commonwealth and to realize the amazing benefit of it for historic preservation. So. Um, even though I think some of us who are on the ground are, are anxious about how this might play out, I, I think that um, you know, there are so many wonderful examples um, of, of how things have been successful. And if you really want to get into this in depth, um, I can't stress enough how important it is to check out the Community Preservation Coalition's website. They are the sort of statewide umbrella group that is you know, coordinating information uh, and advocacy about CPA. And they have, um, they're the sort of information keepers for uh, projects and uh, data about how communities are doing. So you could spend hours on their website looking uh, at how every town who's adopted CPA has spent uh, their CPA funds, uh, uh, the list of projects that they have. Uh, and I think even just kind of uh, leafing through that information uh, is proof that they, you know, we're, we're, we're poised to benefit a lot from, from CPA in Boston. So uh, a couple of the points that, that um, was suggested I speak about are um, what's the best way to facilitate a broad, diverse, and citywide pool of projects looking for funds for, for preservation projects? And in other words, how do we make sure that we're attracting um, projects of uh, many kinds of scales and types? And uh, the, the biggest thing I could think about um, for, for advice about that is to really spend a lot of time up front in putting together the community preservation plan. Uh, that will, has to be updated and renewed every year, but for the first time, I think that provides a real opportunity for folks to have their voices heard and for the Community Preservation Committee to really be um, thorough and comprehensive in how they look at the city and determine what their preservation needs are. And, you know, the staff of the, the Landmarks Commission can do survey and they can sort of be responsive to, um, to the sort of statutory things that they have to deal with, but really, uh, really um, taking the time to sort of step back from regulation and really think about need and project of where um, proactive preservation um, could benefit the city, I think is, is very important. And that development of that plan is a, is a wonderful opportunity to have a lot of voices uh, heard. Um, you know, I think we need to realize as part of that that there's a lot of pent up demand uh, in the city now. Um, and it, since I'm involved in fundraising to a degree in many of my projects, I can attest to the fact that it's very difficult to attract funding to preservation projects. And we all know that there's Massachusetts Preservation Projects Fund from MHC, uh, and there are things in the city of Boston like the Henderson Fund, but you know, getting beyond there, the, the list of places to go to is very short. So uh, even if we uh, take the minimum 10% uh, for preservation, suddenly there's gonna be a, a more substantial pool of funds that we've had to date to, to uh, disperse and to devote to preservation, but it's still a fairly small fund. So the demand is going to be high, and um, I think it's just important to realize that, uh, and uh, that needs to be balanced uh, against the actual amount of funds that are available for use. Um, I think some of the best projects, and this gets to the point of how do we uh, advocate or, or facilitate projects that cross disciplines in the sense of preservation projects that bring in other aspects of community development or development. So, for example, uh, renovating a historic building that also serves for uh, affordable housing. How do you group several of the goals of the CPA uh, into a single project? Uh, and, you know, I think that in developing project criteria that the Community Preservation Committee um, has a chance to sort of set what their priorities are and to set a scale of how projects are, are rated. And, uh, you know, I would advocate that, you know, if you have a project that accomplishes many of the goals of CPA all in one, then you should get a much higher score than maybe one that, that only uh, accommodates uh, uh, one of the goals. Um, again, in, in the sense that we're not uh, um, reinventing the wheel here, I think that there are organizations active in the city of Boston now scanning the city for preservation projects, such as Historic Boston Incorporated, and full disclosure, I used to work there with Kathy before I went out on my own, who've already developed good processes for identifying um, preservation priorities in the city. And I think of the casebook model that HBI used for a number of years, where it was very interactive uh, in, in um, 
approached preservation from a development standpoint, but really uh, involved other pres preservation partners to assess, sort of a, uh, identify a, a, a top list of 30 or 40 projects that everybody agreed, wow, if we could really make something happen with these projects, um, you know, that would be uh, pushing preservation forward in a project, uh, positive way in the city. So some sort of process uh, like that, um, that gets people thinking, especially in the, the initial uh, development of the community preservation plan of how do we, how do we articulate our priorities, uh, not only in terms of types of projects, but in areas of the city that are, are, uh, are, are going to benefit from them. And then finally, um, a bit about how to engage the public. Um, one of the things that I discovered in answering some of the questions from folks who call me from around Eastern Massachusetts was some basic misconceptions about, you know, what is historic preservation? Um, you know, we've got a project where we're going to, this is an example I've probably overused, but we're, we want to tear down the historic building, um, but we're going to rebuild it sort of the same on a different site using some of the stone from the chimney, and we would like CPA historic preservation funds to sell it. Well, <laughs> clearly that is not historic preservation, and uh, I think that, you know, being clear to project proponents from the start that, you know, we are serious about what preservation is. There is a definition of preservation and restoration rehabilitation. Um, and also to make sure people understand that these projects have to follow the Secretary of the Interior standards. And there's a lot of confusion about that, what they mean. They're purposely loosely written. I've seen a lot of town councils and attorneys who come up with very creative definitions of how, <laughs> uh, what they think the Secretary of the Interior standards mean. And I, I think that, you know, I, our, Preservation infrastructure is pretty sophisticated here in Boston, so we're maybe more equipped to deal with some of those uh, issues that come up. But I think that general outreach um, to uh, to project proponents about what what a good preservation project is is important to get out uh, in the beginning. I know that some towns and cities actually, before you can even apply or promote a, a put a project forward, you have to come in and talk to staff or uh, community members to make sure that you understand, you know what. Um, what kind of projects are eligible and then how these projects must be carried out because it's a lot of work to review. It's a lot of work to put applications and proposals together. It's a lot of work to uh, review them. And so I think that education part up front to make sure that everybody understands what's going on is, is very important. Um, and um, um, I think that right. covers that's most good. of the that's points that you laid out. So. Uh, Kathy, would Paul, do you have anything to add on that? Um, well, yeah, well, just quickly, two points. Since Mayor Walsh has, has been in office, you know, community engagement has been a major, major mm -hmm. focus of, of all the work that we do in City Hall. And for those of you who uh, participated in the outreach around Imagine Boston 2030 or Go Boston 2030, you know that we've developed a lot of apparatus, a lot of networks to uh, engage the community on all sorts of planning. And I am uh, optimistic that the work around uh, the Community Preservation Act will be able to draw on those resources and many of the things we've learned, even beyond the, the networks that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Kathy's group or the other, or Greg, your mm -hmm. group have in the city, that, mm -hmm. that there's a, a lot of importance placed on that in City Hall and making sure we're hearing from all parts of the city, no matter what we're doing. Um, and, well, well, that's enough, I'll stop there. Right, Ken. <laughs> um, I guess I would only add just mm -hmm. I think Jeff did a great job framing all of that, but also emphasizing standards and, um, and the preservation ethic um, that should pervade preservation projects. And yet I also would just want to emphasize, and I think you also meant this, that, um, that those guidelines and, and some of that thinking, some of that ethic should pervade the thinking about some of the other areas of CPA, um, not, not just a a historic building being converted into affordable housing, for example, but um, that the, the, the character, the look, the feel, the, the relationship of a new building perhaps being built should be um, thought of in relation to the historic context. And I think we need to be thinking about some of the, the planning um, uh, guidelines, um, ideas, and, and uh, relationships between uh, historic preservation's goals and end game with um, some of the other things that may be new. Um, and that's, um, I think we should just make sure that we are keeping, away, keeping an eye out for the whole program from a preservation point of view. Great, thank you. Um, we'll turn it over for questions. No one? 
All right, let me ask a question that maybe will generate a question. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, one question I had is, you know, there's a lot of ideas that are going to come out. Um, and as you said, it's a, it's a lot of work to review these. The city only has so much staff. We've got Landmarks Commission staff sitting here in the front row that are probably <laughs> potentially quaking in their boots thinking <laughs> of, if there's 300 proposals come in and we have to review them, we already can't keep up with what we have. You know, so, so how do we think about doing that? You know, at the Alliance, we've had some discussions. You know, is there a role for the Alliance in helping sort of gather and prioritize? Not that we really have the staff or the manpower either. You know, is there a role for HBI or other groups? Um, or does it work more like the Henderson and the Brown funds where people just ask us for support letters and the committee will ultimately take those into consideration? Um, there's a lot of different ways to slice this and there's a lot of needs and um, we need to figure out how to do it right. I think one thing you said uh, that's very true is the plan is so important and I think this is why YVB's been you know, somewhat aggressive at this stage because the way this gets out of the gate this first year or two and kind of gets moving really sets the tone for how successful this will be. The structures are in place that we've got a method that'll work. There's a lot we can draw on from that other communities, but Boston's unique uh, in terms of the scale. Um, so any thoughts people have about what do you think a role should be for an organization like the Boston Preservation Alliance, which is not a city organization, we're an independent nonprofit, same for HBI. Landmarks Commission is a city office um, that has great skill and expertise, but limitations unto itself. Um, but has an appointment on the Community Preservation Committee. The Landmarks Commission uh, has a, desi a so a designated right. mm -hmm. commission or membership. Um, so you'll certainly have a voice and be built in. Yes, there's a familiar face. I think the preservation plan is a pretty critical, or the plan, call it the plan, is a pretty critical element of all of this. And I am wondering, because that can be complex, it can be straightforward, it can flexible, it can be rigid. I'm just wondering if perhaps a role for the Boston Preservation Alliance as an independent group is to actually contribute mightily to the preservation plan. So that's a thought. And that second question I have is, I've worked in a lot of different communities with community preservation grants. I seldom have, have actually understood a direct relationship between the grant review process and that preservation plan. <laughs> so while it sounds like a good idea, I'm not sure that the connect often actually connects. Well, and just to add another point about that, I think nothing like this has been attempted citywide. We tend to plan by neighborhoods and micro neighborhoods. We don't often articulate a citywide preservation plan. And yeah. um, that's, that's a big challenge. Uh, it's a lot of information. It's a lot of area to cover. In a, to try to put into a document that already would be complicated, um, you know, to, to try to cover that much ground in it is very, it's untested territory, I think, at this point. Right. Well, I think, I think there's a great opportunity in thinking about that in relationship to Imagine Boston 2030, mm -hmm. since that's the first citywide overall plan yep. that the city has done in 50 years. There might be a natural place for thinking about preservation citywide. So right. it's something we should certainly explore. Mm -hmm. Great idea. Yes. Yeah, can you give me any examples of uh, some of the other neighborhoods that, or not neighborhoods, but other some of the other communities where um, it hasn't worked very well, and some of the mistakes that potentially landmines that Boston can learn from? That's a good question. Jeff, do you have some examples from your work? Well. I think that, that um, one thing that, you, that, that we need to make sure happens is that the, the requirements of CPA, the statutory requirements, are followed carefully. Uh, and part of that involves uh, the placement of restrictions on properties mm -hmm. that, um, that uh, benefit, uh, privately owned properties that benefit from CPA funds as well as public properties, because that is a, that's a big and complicated issue. Uh, and it's something that I think many uh, munis municipalities let slip a bit, but that's the way that you protect your investment, and that's, I think, a critical part of the process. Correct, right, and and all of those, most of those pass through MHC uh, as well, so that's a, that's a critical thing to follow. Um, you know, not to bring up um, 
not great news, but um, the lawsuit in Acton involving the use of CPA funds on religious properties, I think is, is um, a big, um, it's a major issue. And that's proceeding, you know, there's a lot of precedent in Massachusetts through the Massachusetts Preservation Projects Fund of public monies being spent for um, preservation projects on um, historic houses of worship. And that's a sort of a settled issue until this lawsuit came up. But so let me just jump in, because are there people in the room that don't know what Jeff's talking about? I'm guessing. All right, so I think, should I jump in with yeah, a quick go summary? Yeah. So there's a, there's a national organization that uh, focuses on protecting the division between church and state. Uh, they've chosen to sort of take a test case here in Massachusetts that the town of Acton, through their CPA, funded some work on a church. Uh, and their first, uh, they went through one set of court hearings and the, uh, the people appealing or complaining about the, the use of CPA funds lost, they've appealed to the Supreme Judicial Court. So that is currently an active court case. Uh, and if it goes one way, CPA funds would not be able to be spent on religious buildings. Obviously, historic churches are a huge need and have been consistently funded throughout the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll probably be part of an amicus brief where uh, they're talking about that. I know other organizations are. The National Trust is looking at it. Um, but that is a potential issue that's sort of hanging out there um, that may affect how we prioritize or, or, or not uh, projects. And I think that the, the, um, the, the good thing about Acton was that they've very carefully followed um, CPA statutes and everything was, in, so that was a, you know, they have a strong case in Acton to, uh, to rebut this, this lawsuit. But if you were in a town, for example, that maybe didn't follow things so closely, then you might be open to, uh, to uh, challenge. So, you know, I don't know that, um, how many communities have voted to undo CPA? I don't think any have. Okay. Um, no, so, I think this is um, so that says something. And to be honest, the, when I talked about the kinds of things that I see out on my circuit writer work, it's often minor things about, well, the, this historic brick side work walks used to be you know, five feet wide, now they're proposed to be four feet wide. How do we convince th the town that in spite of the expense that, you know, their width is one of their distinguishing features and their important characteristics and we need to follow the Secretary of the Interior Standards and keep them at their original dimension. So it's a lot of kind of technical things uh, that, that uh, I've, I've seen stumble, but, um, you know, I think generally communities uh, are, are using these funds wisely and well and that there's uh, not a lot of dis dissatisfaction out there. Um, I, I, I know nothing about um, <laughs> any, of, uh, in fact, it's remarkable to me that there's been so little um, pushback. Um, it seems to me that, that um, the program's working quite well. But I do, um, I do wonder about the, um, the, the opportunity to be thinking differently about these funds, too. I think we think bricks and mortar. Um, but if we haven't said it here tonight, these funds are available for archival uh, resources, mm -hmm. so paper products, um, miscellaneous, um, uh, in, and in fact have been deployed in different ways. And I'm looking at Greg because I seem to recall that a project that you may have worked on um, constructed either a, a long-term loan or some kind right, of a structure right. that was not just a grant, but fit a different purpose within the needs of the project that you were working on. So my sense is that there's creativity that can be applied to the deployment of these resources, and we should all get as um, up to speed as possible in helping to um, activate them that way. Yeah, I'll just say one of the, and Sarah, I see you have your hand up, so we can get a mic towards you. Um, one of the great things about the way CPA was constructed is that as long as you're sort of within the bounds of the state statute, that it's one of the three causes, um, you know, and some of the other things, that it's capital, et cetera, there's a lot of flexibility within towns to be creative and to tie different things together. You can do artifacts, you can do documents. Um, Kathy was referring to a project I did when I lived in Easton, which was at the Ames Shovel Works that involved CPA coming as uh, some funding for some easements and restrictions, but also part of it was a loan that will get paid back um, over time when some units are converted eventually to condominium units after the affordable housing uh, restrictions burn off over a period of time. There's a lot of different ways to slice it. You can bond against CPA. Again, this would be a decision mm -hmm. that the committee and the city and city council would have to agree to, but it's a continuing revenue stream year to year. So you know the money's coming in, uh, unlike some other funding sources. I mean, I'll just say in terms of issues, I think one of the gripes you hear most about CPA 
is that you have to dedicate 10% minimum to each of the three causes, but you don't have to spend it. You can bank that 10%, and that can be a good thing because a, a town typically could be saving up to buy a piece of open space that they don't have the funds for. But what's happening in some communities, they're not spending any money on affordable housing, for example. That's the, the biggest gripe. This, um, some communities maybe aren't spending enough on preservation or whatever it is. So I think setting up a plan that gets us spending money across all disciplines from the beginning and doesn't assume um, that 80% will go to affordable housing and parks and preservation will get 10. Maybe this year, the, the, the fact that the pendulum can swing year to year depending on the need um, I think is critical. And that all comes down to, as Lynn mentioned, the creation of that plan mm -hmm. and showing that the needs are across the disciplines and across the city is important. But I, I do encourage people to look at the website. Every project is funded. Well, I'd, I'd just like to suggest um, that there could be advisory committees established for each of the categories, and that would be a way to um, involve. So, um, you know, that's just a very normal uh, process. You have your representatives on the main CPA committee, and then you have a historic resources you know, advisory committee and a uh, you know open space recreation advisory committee, and and those people could also be involved in developing, um, you know, everything you know criteria, but also making selections, and uh, you know the, um, the the people who would be represented, you know, who could be on those committees could, you know, be something that's established in the plan. But something I'd also like to suggest, and what I see when I've looked at a lot of the uh, the communities that have CPA, they, they're, it's very project after project, you know, this after this after this. And um, it seems to me that, uh, you know, in speaking, as Kathy was saying, as far as being creative, that there could be programs. You know, we could have, um, you know, something that I've, I would like to suggest, I, I wrote it down, but um, just a, uh, a grant program for um, older homes to, uh, to the owners to rehab. So you establish a program. These were the sorts of things that you know, once existed in the CDBG days. You know, we don't have that money anymore. So um, you know, just um, you know, could be citywide. We have a program. We have criteria. And so it's not just project by project, but you're encouraging people to come forward uh, to accomplish something that you'd, you'd like to do. And that could also, you know, if you have a loan, you could have a loan program. You know, you could have even a um, an archival program. You know, to, uh, sort of what kinds of things you'd like people to come forward with, rather than just, you know, hoping that people figure out and you know come to you with their project. Great idea, Sarah. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. I was very struck by one of your comments, um, and I. I think my general question will end up being, I haven't heard about the role of um, community organization in this. I mention this because I'm a former Cape resident, as in all the towns, very first round went in. And I think the other notable thing at that time was all the towns, and even as a diehard preservationist, I agree, all the towns agreed that 70% would go to open space. The only reason that the Cape isn't covered completely with McMansions is the CPA and uh, the purchase of a lot of open space. And later, after everything in my town was bought up that could be um, a preservationist, I was standing toe to toe with soccer field proponents, but that's another whole story. <laughs> but I just, um, I haven't heard, um, and it literally may be because I did physically here, you guys speak to the role of the community groups that are going to come forward and uh, pounding their fist on the committee and plans are fine and appropriate, et cetera. But um, I think the key to the preservationist is going to be um, who we can activate in our communities. Anyone like to respond to that? I think that we're, we're blessed in Boston with so many community based organizations. And I think every neighborhood in the city of Boston has its own historical society, um, many of which are very active. So there are so many people who are already motivated and activated in neighborhoods who care about this. So I think it's, you know, how do we harness those people and get them into the process in a productive way? You know, that's the real challenge because they're out there. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, 
even Main Street's districts, you know, which was founded in the main, in the preservation movement, you know, have their own boards of directors and people on the ground working to uh, improve their communities and and hopefully to preserve historic structures there too. So it's how do you and how do you coordinate and harness those people to bring them into this process as well without um, creating yet another layer of, <laughs> of, uh, of, of organizations too. And and I would only reemphasize the the role of Yes for a Better Boston because the Preservation Alliance is represented on it. Um, Historic Boston is. Um, there are s well, there's a bunch of affordable bunch housing of groups, a bunch of CDCs, a bunch of neighborhood groups. So Yes for Better Boston, you know, has you know 40 or so community groups. Of Friends of sorts. the Public Garden and Common, um, a cross section of of open space advocates. It. It, that group has been um, is definitely right now s focused on the constitution of the community preservation committee that will ultimately plan and dispense of funds. But um, it intends to be the grassroots, broadly diverse uh, representation of the city, um, and be listening for I think what you're asking for, which is um, the voices of either community organizations or individuals or uh, advocacy neighborhood associations that are interested in either particular projects or interest areas or needs um, and bubble those up to um, the Community Preservation Committee and whatever ongoing planning is undertaken by that group. And I will say our other panelist who unfortunately was unable to be here was Curtis Perrin who's very active in Roxbury. Just as one sample of someone who is of the neighborhood, is of the community and knows of what I'll say obscure projects, they're not obscure to them, and I think that's part of the challenge, which is people, <laughs> and part of the benefit is those community groups know of those projects that maybe have not floated to the surface to us for various reasons, and we need those voices. We need that skill and expertise mm -hmm. to help us understand what's out there and what needs attention across all the disciplines. So mm -hmm. I agree with you. It's a critical part of making this, this work. Yeah, and, and I'd like to reemphasize that, both what Kathy and Greg have said, that it's very important that the different components of the coalition and that we that we all work very hard to to find ways to to strengthen the linkages between historic preservation between preservation of open space and affordable housing because there will be just as there will be neighborhood groups speaking out about historic preservation there will be neighborhood groups clamoring for the other two parts of uh, of the, and the other two areas that CPA could be applied to. So we don't want to just devolve into a fight over the last dollar. We really want yeah. to find ways to have all these different aspects of CPA collectively strengthening and, and strengthening our community in all ways possible. How will the um, how will the act work with the architectural and smaller landmark districts? Will they override No, it's, those? I mean, anything that's done in a local district would follow the same rules. It's, it, this isn't like a 40B process, which has a, an ability to mm -hmm. slip by. It, it, just because something's funded by CPA doesn't, I wouldn't think, impact any other regulations, rules that, that exist. No, I think that's why all the agencies are represented on the... the so basically committee. it will work the same way it always works. Someone applies or presents to one of the commissions, and it's really just a funding mechanism. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Thank yeah. you. All right, I'm going to move on to part three for our last, you know, 15, 20 minutes here, which is really a, a chance to do some brainstorming about project ideas. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to talk, say anything specifically before we just turn it over for questions. We talked a little bit on the phone um, about uh, the idea that, you know, you can think about the needs in the preservation world any anyway as far as categories. We might not necessarily want to divide up the funding this way, but in terms of a thought exercise, there are you know, city-owned historic buildings in some communities. That's actually been the focus of how they spend their CPA dollars. I don't think that's what we want here in Boston. I think there's certainly a need for that, and there's mm -hmm. a desire for some of that, but we wouldn't want to eat all the money. Historic churches, you could do it all there. Again, there's that court case. Um, other nonprofits, artifacts and documents, um, public art like statues, private homes, as Sarah mentioned. Um, we certainly get that call a lot. I'm in a historic district. Is there money to help me? And it's like, no, there's not. Well, there could be a way to do that through CPA. We'd have to figure out how that would work equitably and make people feel that it was being done appropriately. 
And then there are you know, oddball things, stone walls, mile markers, other historic infrastructure. You know, we could divide this up into categories, either as a thought exercise or as a funding structure, um, or you just sort of open up the big funnel um, and say, or both. Um, so that was just some general thoughts I have. Did anyone else have anything else before we just turn it over? All well, right. Go ahead. Well, just to echo um, Sarah's comment about programs as opposed to projects, and I know that there are great examples already happening in communities. Um, for example, Cambridge, I believe, has uh, a grant program for historic homeowners, and they also have something um, called uh, an... Uh, Where's my note there? It's, well, it's, it's, to, it's a specific portion of their funds set aside uh, for nonprofits that operate out of historic structures. So for exterior preservation work, um, accessibility upgrades, uh, and co-compliance that directly impacts historic fabric. So that I think that there are ways to kind of set aside pools of funds that could have focus, uh, perhaps focus on a particular priority or uh, area um, rather than you know, going by the project by project approach. I like that idea. And those priorities could sort of shift after right. so many years to sort of spread the, spread the wealth. All right, ideas, projects, things that you came in s that you wanted <laughs> to say because it's burning a hole in hopefully the city's pocket to spend money on. <laughs> yes, in the front row. It just occurred to me that what I would like to see is are less chain link fences. <laughs> <laughs> Is that open space? Or? Okay. See, to me, that represents exactly the kind of, uh, what would we preservationists say if a proposal came forward for a, um, a, an open space uh, th that had a chain link proposal in it? What might we say about that? <laughs> um, it's not necessarily a historic resource, but it, there's a, you know, without getting too heavy onto aesthetics and, and get in trouble for that, but what might we say about that from a, a char neighborhood character standpoint um, or a contextual standpoint? So I, I, I guess I will now say that I'd like to hear those thoughts too as maybe some guidelines that might be, might extend beyond just the bounds of a historic building or a, a historic fabric and into um, how we think the preservation might help to inform the rest of the program. I hope I didn't interrupt you, though, <laughs> just then. Anyone else? Sorry. There's going to be more <laughs> thoughts. Well, I'll give the thought as a follow-up to that, which is, you know, is there a basic question? When I think about us doing particularly a new project that might put up a fence is, I think the logical question is, do we really want our city money going towards that? You know, if that's sort of the one measure, if you find yourself, ask yourself that question. If the answer is yes, we move forward. If the answer is no, whether it's related to preservation or open space or a new design that doesn't seem to quite work, right. if the answer is no, then maybe they need to go back to the drawing board and, and rethink about it. Oh, come on, there's gotta be more. You're just anxious you to eat whatever food you saw over there, Lynn. <laughs> well, this is a question that goes back to the public benefit and the preservation plan. Um, and Jeff, you mentioned it earlier. One of the requirements with a grant to a specific project is a preservation restriction. Many communities are, again, kind of blinking on this because of the administrative issues associated with it. I'm just wondering about whether that, what kind of public, are there other ways of thinking about ensuring the public benefit? Um, and one example that I'll bring forth is I'm working with a group that has an interest in a large artist studio building. So one of the concepts is to create a gallery teaching space that would be part of the public programming and otherwise what is essentially private studio space. That's one form of thinking about public benefit. But with it is this preservation restriction aspect and administratively, and Jeff, you're nodding your head, we know that that's a problem right now with how it's being administered through Mass Historical. So that's a conundrum. Two questions. One, you know, how do we find public benefit? And two, how do we really effectively deal with the preservation restriction aspect of this program? That's a great question. I mean, how, um, you know, we, easements are a tricky business in general, as Historic Boston knows, and anyone who administers them knows. Um, 
I see Carissa from Historic New England out there. Um, and you know that I, I like bringing up that question of what are other benefits that actually benefit the public in a tangible way instead of a deed restriction or something that you know maybe legalistically protects you, but can we um, interpret that flexibly to take into account other ways that the public um, um, benefits from investments in these b these buildings? And um, uh, you know, I, I don't have any answers to what those mechanisms might be, but that's that, that's really something interesting to think about. Um, you know, and I know that's a question that came up with me as, as Yes for Better Boston was sort of developing our draft ordinance. Uh, Kathy and I suggested some language requiring an easement. The state statute, I don't believe, requires the no. easement as the public benefit. It's been the sort of the logical one, and it makes sense in some ways because if there's public money going into a building, you don't want someone to then resell it and flip it, and then the new owner decide they don't like what you ever spent, what you spent money on. But there's the challenge of administering them, and I think the challenge also becomes if you do smaller homeowner type projects, you know, fifteen or twenty thousand dollars. That would mean a lot to get these buildings back to where we, right. you know, at least in the right direction. That's not worthy of a preservation restriction, not only for the right. person taking the money, but for the city or whomever to manage. So how do we assure that the investment is held over a period of time, maybe through some other rules and regulations, um, and how do we uh, find a different mechanism for public benefit. So I think these are all good questions and ones that we're going to have to grapple with and be more creative. Sarah? The um, federal um, rehab tax credit program, which could be uh, a huge amount of money to a, um, an investor, and those are for five years. They expire. So you could have, um, you know, and, and the way they work is that you, you pay, it's prorated, you pay it back if you don't um, uh, keep the property as um, intended for five years. So there could be some time frame, something like that, that, like that. that you have a, you know, a limited time frame that um, for, for the investment. You know, if it's, if it's, you know, not a nonprofit or a city owned building, you know, but where you might want to take a, a, a deed restriction, but if it's a, a privately owned building. It's a good thought. Anyone else? What other project ideas? We've got a few more minutes. Sorry, we've got a few hands back here. Well, we were talking earlier about um, homeowners who have historic windows, maybe having a fund, either loan, grant, forgivable loan, something to help people be able to afford to restore their older windows rather than put vinyl ones in. Right, good idea. And right. the, the, the city had a, a pr the city has done this before with a historic homeowner program. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is, some of these mechanisms are not new uh, in Boston. I don't think that that program exists anymore. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, that was a great program that um, gave um, either small loans or, or grants to smaller preservation projects that involved things like windows and sensitive rehabs to historic houses, so. Hi. Diana Jacobs Commissar from the Huntington Theater Company. Um, I'd like to know about cultural facilities because I know that the Massachusetts Cultural Council already has the Cultural Facilities Fund and if there's going to be any overlap there um, because we're, as you may know, are about to embark on a program to renovate our historic theater originally built in the 1920s, which was actually the first nonprofit theater in America, I believe. So we know that the MCC exists, but because it's per specifically a preservation project, I want to know what the potential was there. It's probably very similar to the way that the um, Mass Cultural Council reviews historic places or historic buildings that are also cultural facilities. Um, but I think a lot of the, the guidelines for, for uh, questions about restrictions and, and matters like that probably need to be evaluated. But I think in the advocacy period of, of the ballot measure and all of that, one of the things that we did talk a lot about is how um, CPA could be very beneficial to other public policy priorities um, within communities, and that was very much one of them. Theaters, um, other types of homes for um, cultural expression. So th there's, there's uh, certainly nothing to prevent it, but I think you're calling it out um, should, as we're asking, put it on the, uh, the radar screen. <laughs> I, I think it's great. I think it points to one of the things that I know other CPA communities are doing, which is the idea of leveraging CPA. 
maybe not requiring, but if we do end up with a scoring system, for example, maybe you mm -hmm. get a higher score if CPA money matches with MTC money, or if it's an affordable mm -hmm. housing project and there's uh, federal affordable housing uh, tax credits, or a historic project that is also going for federal historic tax credits. So you can really leverage up this money, and CPA can be part of a bigger puzzle um, that in many of these projects do require many pieces of a pie. Um, so with that, unless someone has a burning question, oh, I see two more. Uh, mm -hmm. Suddenly it was the clock runs the out. Gearing up. Um, <coughs> let's see, let's go to the uh, middle, more towards the front here. We'll come back to you last, I think. Thank you. You, you may have um, touched on this earlier. Is that just wondering, what kind of timeline do you expect for the, uh, the process to be in place? When do you think the funds may become available? Mm. Carl, do you want to try that? Because we don't know is the real answer. <laughs> that, that, that's exactly right. I mean, we will start collecting the funds with the new fiscal year that starts on July 1st, but actual expenditure of funds will depend on the formation of the committee and, and well, first the agreement on the ordinance and then the selection of the committee. The committee will have to do a needs assessment first, and following that, they can start sp spending mm. an actual project. So. I don't know, what would you guess? At, at least a year, I would really expect, uh, before we're actually spending money on actual projects, but you know, we could be surprised. No, I, I mean, I, from our meetings early on, um, there's clearly a desire to get the voters to see some fruits of their, their, their vote. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if we see some money come out before the plan is complete, because to do a good long plan, a good comprehensive plan, will take a long time. So it wouldn't surprise me if there are a couple of projects that float to the surface to kind of surface to try to get the, the wheels greased. Um, but we'll see. It's, we don't really have an answer at this point. All right, I think there's another question in the front row. All right, um, I think Jeffrey can maybe answer this question, but you know, there are organ groups out there like for the MPPF funds and the Massachusetts Cultural Facility funds that um, a lot of those need matching grants. Right. Will CPA money be able to be used for matching those kinds of things? That is a technical question, and it's, it's not the case in all cases. So I've, I've reviewed Mass Cultural Facilities Fund grants, and I have in the back of my mind um, that if you're using state funds for some, you need to make sure that the project's jived. So I would double check that, but that's a great question to, to ask. Um, and I believe MPPF projects can be used as a match on CPF funds, but I'm not sure about Mass Culture Facilities funds. Okay, grants. thanks. I recall in reviewing them that I've, I've seen CPA in reviewing and PPF, no, sorry, Cultural <laughs> Facilities <laughs> Fund um, proposals. So you think it's okay? I think so. Okay. Yeah. That may be the case. But that needs to be confirmed. All right, I think any, any last thoughts from the panel? All right, then I'll close with a few brief <laughs> thoughts because I'm not one to be <laughs> short of words, usually, <laughs> as my kids always remind me. Um, I just say, keep your eyes peeled. This, this is a community project. I mean, this is, we need voices from everyone, from throughout the city. Um, as Kathy said, Yes for Better Boston remains very active and keeping its ears open. So um, we've recently, YBB has recently retooled their website from the election website to one that's starting to look more like one about implementation. Um, if you think that Yes for Better Boston should play a, a formal role, go ahead and call your city councilor, call the at-large councilors and say that. Um, let us know, the Preservation Alliance or anyone sort of at the table. Uh, if you have ideas, feel free to email us about projects, any further questions. Be engaged. This is a, this is a program that the people wanted. It's an opportunity to be a voice of the people and I think to answer the question that came early on about how do we make sure that there isn't too much political pressure. Well, political pressure can be a good thing if it's the voters making the pressure. Mm -hmm. And I think City Hall and the commi commission, once it gets formed, need to know that and need to know they're accountable. Um, and YBB, is, and there's, by the statute creating CPA and by some of the things uh, YBB has been asking for, um, there's a lot of public reporting. This is a very transparent program. Mm -hmm. It's designed not to be a slush fund for fill in the blank. It should be a slush fund for the voters. Um, so <laughs> continue to watch, continue to express your opinions, and this will be a great program, but only if everyone throughout the city is involved. Call your friends and neighbors um, to help out. It's only gonna work if everyone helps. So thank you for all yeah. for coming. Um, hopefully the rain has stopped. Uh, <laughs> enjoy spring and keep an eye on this as it continues to evolve. Thank okay. you. Thank you.
the one part that I did want to focus on in this presentation um, and spare you most of it since you saw the design was uh, this idea of process and uh, the complexity of, as you touched on, dealing uh, with um, governance uh, in, in the United States.